Hi, this is Chloe from Inner Whispers and welcome to this online Learn Lenormand training. Before we jump into looking at the topics and making a start on looking at the history of the cards and the schools and lots of other good stuff, I'd like to ask you how you learn best. And this is relevant because it's good for you to think about what you can do to cement this learning as we go along. So you might find, for example, that journaling, mind maps, trying things out, thinking things through, seeing things, or hearing an explanation are the best way for you to learn. Or perhaps it's more like a little bit of all of those. Whatever it is that you find most helpful in learning, try and do some of that here. So for example, in a lot of places I'm going to ask questions and it would be great if you stop and pause, have something to hand in order to make notes and think about the questions before kind of going on and seeing the answers that I give, the suggested ideas here. Because that way you'll make the learning much more your own. And if you want to, outside of that, take some time to journal about that, do mind maps or whatever else, then that's really useful stuff to make the learning more effective. In this course, which is made up out of 12 different videos, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Here in this first video, we're going to look at the history of the cards and also the levels of interpretation, as well as the different schools and ways of learning the cards and ways of interpreting the cards. In later videos, we'll look at the individual card meanings and also how to blend cards, as well as reading lines and also spreads, reading for yourself and for others, and also about the playing card inserts that you find on the Norman cards, as well as a separate short video on the question of timing. So, if we look at the history of the cards, the most obvious place to start is with the person who gave them their name. Marianne Adelaide Lenormand and she is a historic figure who quite a lot of information is available about. She wrote a lot of books and quite a lot of people also wrote about their experience of her and she appears also obviously in kind of official documentation though even so there are quite a few questions around her life. She was born either in 1772 or uh, 1768, depending on which version of the truth you take. And she was schooled in a convent and later moved to Paris, where she got herself a wealthy aristocratic mentor and was introduced to the Salon Society and became known as the Sybil of the Salons. She is said to have read for Josephine and she read about Napoleon, but she never actually read for him directly. She did, however, read for a lot of nobility and politicians and other people who were involved with the momentous happenings at that time. Um, very interestingly, though, and very importantly, she never actually read with a 36-card Lenormand deck. So where did those cards actually come from? Well, the cards that we have now are uh, directly linked to a deck created by a man called Johann Kaspar Hechtel, who was a German. And he created a deck that he called the Spiel der Hoffnung, or the Game of Hope. And for this game, the cards were laid out in a square, actually in a sort of rectangle, nine by four. And it was a board game as such, where you threw dice and you moved along. And the idea of it was to get to card 35, the anchor, a symbol of hope, rather than getting beyond it to card 36, the cross, where you would lose, fall off, have sorrows. And Johann Kaspar Hechtel, in his cards, he created the numbering system, which we now know as the traditional Lenormand numbering system, and he also added in the playing card inserts, which are used by a number of readers. So he is very much the direct ancestor, the direct creator of what has become known as the Lenormand deck, the Petit Lenormand deck. 
If we look further back in time, we come to the Coffee Grounds cards, as they're known. And this is an Austro-German deck from 1794, so it predates the Game of Hope, and it predates the first actual set of Lenormand cards, which were brought out in 1850, by quite a chunk. If we look at these Coffee Ground cards, the numbering is somewhat different, and there are some different objects on it. For example, the clover is number three instead of number two, and I believe that there's a lion instead of a bear. So there are differences, but there are also a lot of similarities. A great number of the cards that are found in the Lenormand system are also found in these Coffee Grounds cards, and many of the interpretations are traditional interpretations that are found in the original little white books that accompanied the Lenormand cards when they first started being sold more than 50 years after this deck was created. So that's a brief history of the Putti Lenormand deck. There is also a Grand Lenormand deck which is over 50 cards, very different, lots of astrological symbolism in there, totally different set of images and so forth. So if you have that deck then this video series is not what you want because we're not going to be talking about that here at all. What we are going to look at though is different ways of interpreting the cards and before we start on that I wanted to mention the different schools of Lenormand. There are some people who say that the schools don't really matter, the only difference is whether you look at distance or combinations. Well, I think that there's actually a balance to be had here because there are great areas of commonality amongst German readers. Now, different German readers will read differently, just as every reader reads a little bit differently. However, there are common themes that you can see within the German speaking readership, perhaps, rather than school. Um, as compared to, for example, the French school, or the Brazilian school, or the Russian school, or the Dutch and Belgian school. So, for instance, the Germans generally tend to read the anchor card as a card of work, whereas the French more often see the moon as the card for work. The Germans tend to see the bear as a masculine card, the French more often see it as a feminine card, a mother-like card, rather than a, a boss or mentor-type card, which the Germans would most often see. The Russians, for example, read things very differently and traditionally read with reversals, which is something which you might have heard people say, you never read Lenormand with reversals. Well, the Russians always do, that's part of their tradition. And if we look at the Brazilian school, then, for example, they have very positive meanings for card 36, the cross, perhaps due to the strong Catholic element in that country. And card 2, which in most Lenormand systems is the clover, in the Brazilian school traditionally was actually called the logs and was about small obstacles in your way rather than small positive things. So there are differences between the different schools. One of those big differences, perhaps, is the idea of do you read by distance or by combinations. Now traditionally, for example, with the Coffee Grounds cards, they were described in terms of near and far, and that was how close or far the Coffee Grounds are from the rim of the cup, as opposed to how close the particular cards are lying together. So there is a degree to which reading with distance will give you a different kind of perspective on the cards. Here I will mainly talk about combinations and there is also a connection there between distance and combinations because you only tend to read cards in combination if they fall together or if they are in some other way related to one another and so that echoes the distance and the near and far if they're close together then you combine them and if they're far apart then you would only combine them in very specific circumstances which may respond a little bit to the idea of distance in a reading. So how are Lenormand cards actually read? Because they're read quite differently from tarot cards. Lenormand cards are treated like pictographs, almost like hieroglyphs. 
And so instead of you looking at the image and seeing a picture and reading what do I notice different elements from this image, the image itself represents something else, some core key words. So for example, if you see the fox, you don't think, oh, he has a long bushy tail. You would think more fox means perhaps street smarts or cunning, deception, a trickster, some of those things, looking at the key words. In that sense, as I say, it's more like a pictograph rather than an image that you would use for visual cues and triggering. However, you can throw your net a little bit wider with Lenormand cards. You may have core keywords, and those might be only maybe four or so. But there are different levels of interpretation of the cards, which give you a broader variety of meanings. So let's have a look at those different levels of interpretation. The levels of interpretation that we can use for the cards include the symbolic, the literal, the form of the object that is described, cartomantic from the playing card inserts that Johann Kaspar Hechtel put into the cards, the image itself, though that's one of the less traditional ways of using the cards, and each card can represent a person or characteristics of a person. There are also timings associated with the cards, and we'll have a video specifically on that, and there are also health associations for the cards. So let's take an example of the ring and think about the questions that we might ask in terms of these different levels of interpretation. Questions like, what does a ring symbolise? What is a ring's actual form? What is a ring at a literal level? What are the associations for the ace of clubs? What does the particular image say to you? What type of person is associated with the card? And what health associations might it have? Thinking symbolically, a ring represents a commitment or a bond. It can also be seen as the circle of life. And that never-ending form represents also the idea of infinity or something that is never-ending, eternal. Karma can be seen in that cycle. Power and wealth, if you think about rings that were used as status symbols, like the Pope wears a specific ring, or nobility would have a ring that was their seal of office or their personal seal that they would use to seal um, a letter. So rings represented power and wealth in that regard. And a ring also represents wholeness, cycles, and the idea of unity. At a literal level, a ring is, of course, a ring, something that you wear on your finger. And more broadly, it could be used to suggest jewellery in general. As for its form, it's in the form of a circle. So it could be used to represent something that is circular. And if, for example, you had lost something and you asked where it was, if you drew the ring, you might say it's in a circle of some kind. If you've been to the theatre, maybe you dropped it in your seat which was in the circle, something along those lines. At a cartomantic level, the ace of clubs is associated with fame and with wealth, which aren't really such traditional um, ideas for the ring, but you may want to have those at your fingertips as another level of interpretation for it. If we think about the image, and here there's um, an example from the Celtic Lenormand, we might think of it showing commitment, but also a bond or a partnership. As a person, it might suggest someone who is committed or a partner. And at the level of health, it could represent a chronic or repetitive illness, or also the idea of circulation. So, holding all these ideas about the levels of interpretation in mind, let's move on to looking at the actual cards, their core meanings, and their different potential interpretations. 